Välkomna in. Här står jag med Katrin Thorleifsson. Hej, jag ska hej. presentera dig lite mer alldeles strax. Vi ska låta alla komma på plats lite till. Jo, vi ska prata om overheating. Eller du ska prata om overheating. Katrin... Här, Katrin Thorleifsson, hon är postdoktor vid, nu får du rätta mig om jag har fel, Socialantropologiska institutet och Center för extremistforskning vid Oslo universitet. Och sen har du en doktorsgrad från London School of Economics and Political Science och du kommer ju hålla ditt föredrag här eller tal på engelska, dels för att vi ju faktiskt har internationella gäster också. Du har forskat på nationalism, på gränser, på identitetspolitik baserat på antropologiskt fältarbete mellan Östern och Europa. Och Katrin är en av deltagarna i projektet Overheating som leds av Thomas Hyllande Eriksson som väl också är knuten till Oslo universitet. Katrin ska snart få en sydlig värld här. Hon kommer att tala på ämnet användningen och instrumentaliseringen av det förgångna i en tid av kulturell komplexitet. Och jag kan bara säga själv att när jag har fått förmånen att läsa in mig på materialet så har jag blivit... Ja, det här känns väldigt, väldigt spännande. Så jag, nu lämnar jag scenen till dig. Välkommen, Katrin. Thank you very much. It's great to be here and going through the program I was also very encouraged to see that not only are you so many from the Swedish National Heritage Fund but also from government, civil society and education. And I think in our time it's key that we lift this conversation across various spheres of society, particularly also in the light of the election this morning, which really shows how culture heritage can be politicized. I'm a social anthropologist and the way I work when I'm studying the rise of the radical right or heating identity politics in Europe is that I go to local communities and I live there and I stay for a period of time. Now I've been part of a project for two years called Overheating the Three Crises of Globalization where we're trying to answer the question, how does globalization affect belonging and social identification? And identity and belonging can be approached in a very static way. The founder of anthropology, Branislav Malinowski, he went to exotic places, collected culture and displayed it. This was the culture of the exotic other. Now, speaking on Google and Facebook, increasingly we acknowledge that culture is shaped by global flows of ideas, people, images. And we have to study processes of hybridity and culture creolization. We've been working in many different parts of the um, globe, and I did fieldwork in Hungary and England. The background for my projects was the interest in the renationalization processes we're seeing in Europe. Now, across various European contexts, the radical right is protesting European and global integration. Now, as we know from the outcomes of the presidential election this morning, Donald Trump is going to be America's next president. And what both Le Pen, Viktor Orban, Nigel Farage, and Donald Trump, what they're promising is basically grounded in nostalgia for a past. They're promising to restore the greatness of a nostalgic era, of a golden era of opportunity and security. Now to understand the appeal of this story, one really needs to take into account the structural, the structural adjustment in Europe. Now in overheating, we focused on the economy, culture, identity and climate crisis. And my initial question when I went to these places was, is there a correlation between economic crisis and the rise of radical nationalism? Today I'm going to share two stories with you based on my findings. And one is from an old mining community in Doncaster. Doncaster is an old mining town in South Yorkshire. It's an hour and a half with a train from London. 
And I lived in London for many years. And London is, as we know, super diverse. It's a cosmopolitan place. It's what the sociology, sociologist Stephen Vertovex refers to as super diverse. So, so social scientists, they don't talk about multiculturalism anymore because that's dividing culture into discrete enclaves. They talk about super diversi diversity and the diversification of diversity. Yet in Doncaster, only an hour and a half from London, it's a different story. It's predominantly white working class that has undergone diversification processes, but more slow. I moved there in May 2015, and two key events had occurred. That month, Nigel Farage and UKIP, United Kingdom Independence Party, obtained its electoral breakthrough on a platform protesting European integration and, and um, the European Union and migration. Now, how come did Nigel Farage manage to obtain 24% of the vo votes in a town that traditionally has been heavily pro-Labour. This was the seat of Ed Miliband. It was considered to be safe and secure, but anyways, UKIP went from 4% to 24%. The same month, Great Britain's l last coal mine closed. And this was also a historical moment, because since 1989, when the mine started shot on the Thatcherism, this kind of was the last um, you know, the last in the coffin, and the community collapsed. Doncaster today has one of the highest unemployment rates, and it has only been accelerated since the financial crisis. So this is the story of a town that went from boom to bust. At the same time, during the 1990s, when this town was struggling, it became more diverse, with labour migration predominantly from Poland, but also from other places. So next to English, Polish is one of the most spoken languages in Doncaster. And I was interviewing people, both the UK voters, but ordinary people. How did they feel about the changes affecting their town? Both the outsourcing of the factories to China and other countries, but also the rapid diversification of new migrants arriving. And the answers I got is contrary to just that this would just the old traditional white angry men, it was actually lots of friction and lots of uncertainty on how to deal with these changes. And people were searching for a compelling story, a new vision for the town that was so tied up to empire and industrialism. Now in the local museum of history, I went to examine how did Doncastrians narrate their past. And what I realized that the past kind of ended with the closing of the mines. As you can see from one of the posters, although the speed has slowed down, development has continued. Today, the town is experiencing a revival as it emerges from the trauma caused by the closure of so many coal mines. The 1960s developments are already making way for something new. So to narrate the future, the museum goes back to an industrial past. In 1991, Doncaster was considered and recognized as one of the poorest towns in European Union. It has only 18,000 inhabitants, but the wider borough in Yorkshire has several hundred. And again, creating a vision for the town was modeled around a golden past of coal. Gemma was a slogan with an accent on progress, England's northern jewel, Doncaster, vital initiatives with a better future in mind. One can answer, is this really also nurturing equality before, before the past? Well, I would say that this had quite exclusionary aspect, considering this was also a moment of rising diversity. So instead of reaching out to create maybe a story or an exhibition that highlights the changing demographic face of Doncaster, it was this kind of cold, cold nationalism that was being nurtured. At the same time, there was also very evident nostalgia for the past. So people my generation, without having lived through the closing of the mines, with no living memory, even nostalgically remember this past, tattooing a miners' lamp on their legs or, or scribing this memory on their bodies. Of the reach to the Roman past, so Doncaster also was the site where some Roman shields were found, 
um, as a glorious past one could be proud of. But the people I spoke to said, you know, we're stuck here and there's not really nothing to be proud of. And there was a shame associated with the heavily stigmatized town. Now let's look at those attempts of trying to celebrate culture complexity. In 1991, Doncaster Multicultural Calendar, 1990, was celebrating Doncaster's emerging diversity. But again, it was through the prism of multiculturalism, so dividing cultures and religious communities into discrete enclaves. In 2015, this was challenged by a visionary editor, editor of this local magazine called Doncopolitan. We might be stuck, but we also have cosmopolitan qualities. The answer is not exclusionary nationalism. It's Europe. It's based on celebrating diversity of gay and lesbian rights. It's based on anti-fascism and acknowledgement of um, a nation that is more inclusionary. At the same time, in the editorial, it's also embraced John Caster's call Black Underbelly. So this is an attempt to try to both nurture a distinct identity modelled around the cold past, but also reach out to differentiate, differentiated others. This was also an exhibition that was trying to reveal the working class identities that felt marginalised and ignored by the liberal elites in London. This is a photo of Susan, who's the single mother of five children and who has been on welfare since, since the age of 14. And John, to the right, is a construction, construction worker who lost the jobs in the mines and is also now on benefits. And highlighting their stories is trying to also communicate and reinscribe their narratives in, um, and challenge, challenge dominant narratives. Another way in which culture was trying to be constructed in Doncaster was through the establishment of a culture centre. Now, this is a well-known strategy. It's a struggling town. Let's boost it with a few million pounds and build a culture centre. Now, I attended multiple exhibitions and performances in this centre, but I was struck that there were no locals there. And when I interviewed my local friends, the informer said, so said well, it has no pub. It's too expensive. And where I claim my benefits is next to the, this structure. So both the location was wrong, the price was wrong, and it did manage to create that zone of dialogue or, or that um, Adam spoke about, to create a zone where you can meet other people and have meaningful conversations. And whenever the local culture was displayed, it was in a quite exotic manner, like this Sikh group performing their traditional dance, and it didn't draw many uh, white Doncastrians, so there seemed to be a quite distance between the white working class and the local uh, communities of other uh, British and English citizens. So my point is that, yes, diversity was celebrated, but boundaries were maintained. And I think this is the real challenge, is you know, maybe it's, yes, people want to belong. And as also several have spoken about, one cannot deconstruct nationalism away. Because people really want to belong. But how can one create places where people can redefine the boundaries, reimagine the boundaries of the nation? And that seems to be a key challenge. And in this space of uncertainty, of the struggle of a meaning identity, Nigel Farage comes in, locating the annual conference of UKIP in Doncaster, moving the town from a stigmatized margin to the forefront of the nation. And to the sounds of the Swedish rock band Europe, it's the final countdown. I'm in the audience and Nigel Farage comes and promises, we're going to get out of the world and into the EU. This was after the election, and remember, it was a crisis of representation, a deprived working class only obtaining one MP in Parliament. And as a, a local politician says, I guess English these days means not being an immigrant and being proud of that. Our local schools are swamped with people who can't speak English. As a UK politician, I have to say I'm doing this for Britain, but I'm also doing this for England. 
We need to wrap ourselves in the flag of St. George. We have to fight for what is English. British socialists have long undermined any sense of nationalism, but people want to belong. If we can't have nationalism, what are we then besides some people living in the land? No, we need to be proud of England. I would say that Guy Ashton had a point. Yes, people want to belong. But the obvious problem with such a narrative is that it has very clear exclusionary elements. It's excluding newcomers, it's excluding immigrants, and excluding those who are non-white. In a very careful campaign, and I would say this is quite interesting because Nigel Farage has also been a key supporter of the Trump campaign. They've used the same advices, the same advices on communication, the same advices on Twitter. So these are very strong transnational links. And it's obviously how culture is appropriated and instrumentalized. Say no, say no to the EU and Europe, protect our heritage, control our borders, believe in Britain. So suddenly the notion of heritage is frozen and obtains a certain quality that's excluding others. Now, during the build-up to the referendum in June, culture heritage was also extended to include civilization. This is um, Facebook. It was posted on UKIP Facebook. It's an interview with the conservative news site Breitbart where Nigel Farage basically says, questions of border controls, identity and security are the issues on which the referendum will be determined. But he also says that you have to, we have to stand up for our Judean Christian heritage. For the good of our people and our nation, we must leave the European Union. And this is a reaction to the crimes in Cologne, where, as you remember, one of the perpetrators were of uh, asylum seeker. So blaming the crimes committed in Cologne and associating one million migrants with this crime and using it in defense of Judean Christian heritage. So let's go to my second fieldwork site, which is Hungary. This is where I went in October last year. So my project has been in several countries and I've been interviewing the leadership, but also normal, ordinary people, equal before the past in post-communist Hungary. Now, this has been written a lot about in the media, but I want to, to show my, my own material, which is based on traveling with the extremist party Jobbik movement for a better future. In last October, this poster was uh, placed around in public space and it warned Hungarians, um, asylum seekers, if you come to Hungary, you have to respect our culture. Now, this campaign, the anti-immigration campaign, occurred straight after the Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris, so associating migrants with culture threats and, and terrorism. Now, the Hungarian case draws striking similarities to the, U the UKIP and Doncaster case. Again, it was about rebordering the nation, both in a physical and symbolical sense. And I traveled with the vice president of Jobbik called, um, um, into a town called Martonvasar and looking at their strategies of excluding and including the other. Now, Jobbik is Europe's most successful right-wing extremist party and it's made up of people born in the 1980s and ma many are educated historians. But they're using the past in a very particular way excluding both minorities, and they're being used, uh, known for their anti-Semitic discourse and also anti-Roma hatred. Like Nigel Farage, the leadership of Jobbik went to deprived and marginalized places to be a voice of the working men and women. And interviewing Jobbik members, I also saw how grammars of exclusion were reconfigured in response to the refugee crisis. Now, as we know in Europe, the refugee crisis could be an opportunity to create solidarity and new spaces of inclusion. But in Hungary, it was the fierce securitization of migrants and dehumanization of the other. Now, in this particular meeting, there were 
I noted lots of conspiratorial thinking about who were actually responsible for Syrian displacement in Europe. And one common reply was that it was George Soros who's financing the Muslim overtaking of Europe, or that Syrian migrants are the biological weapon of American Jews who are trying to Islamify Europe. So old anti-Semitism got a new anti-Muslim layer in the face of a new crisis. And I think that's key to see that, that when faced with a new crisis, it's old hatreds, hatreds and how the past is being used and to legitimize the exclusion of newcomers. And what was the solution to this crisis, to this existential crisis, not only facing Hungary, but the whole of Europe, in the words of Viktor Orban? Well, it was white European masculinity to the rescue. And as Gabor Vona, the leader of Jobbik, said, the freedom fighters drew their strength from the patriotic interwar regime of Miklos Horthy. Hungarians have always emerged as the moral victors from ho hopeless battles throughout history. Again, Gabor Wona has the master's degree in history. And as you know, Miklos Horthy was also responsible for the deportation of 500,000 Jews and their murder, uh, and also of other minorities, which is still in living memory. So how come in Europe you have a party that has 22% of the votes from younger people, also urban, middle uh, class, educated, supporting a party that's openly anti-Semitic, openly appealing to parliament, uh, extra parliamentary military violence, and that is demonizing and dehumanizing minorities. Well, one, one answer to that is that they provide a compelling vision and story. Jobbik is more than a party, it's also a political movement. And I know this has been popular for populists to say recently, but it actually is a, a movement providing strong identity to young people. And this is a photo I took at the Budapest Square of um, a bust of Miklos Horthy, because now there's been a cult of commem commemoration emerging around Miklos Horthy the last few years. Very controversial, and intellectuals and concerned Hungarians are obviously protesting these developments. And finally, I also would like to show a photo that I think is quite telling of the struggle over identity and memory occurring in present-day Hungary. Now, this is a monument showing the arc, uh, the innocent Archangel Gabriel that being descended upon by Nazi Germany. And this was erected in 2014 during the night because it was too controversial, because critics of this monument said that it diminishes the voice and role of the victims of the 500,000 that were murdered during Holocaust. So to protest what critics call the falsification of history, they reinscribe biographies through a living monument. And as you can see, in this living monument, you have personal artifacts, images of Holocaust survivors, but also their descendants. And every single day since this monument was erected, there has been daily protests and appeals that gathers both survivors, but also activists to protest the renationalization processes occurring in Hungary. And the protest I attended this day was the number 553 in line. So they're really um, insisting on voicing their resistance. Now, what's interesting also with this kind of reinscribing biographies and challenging narration of the past is that they were also drawing clear parallels to the plight of the refugees arriving through Hungary, passing through Hungary on the way to Western European destinations. Hungary was the country that received most according to the population, 170,000. But most of them were on their way to Germany or to Sweden or other Western European countries. But still, this critical moment was used to re-narrate, reinvent and reimagine the boundaries of the nation in a way that excluded diversity in very problematic ways. Now, to sum up so far, I think you know, my work is looking particularly at the forced reinforcation of boundaries. And one presenter today said, well, what if we started with what unites us? 
And I think that's important because in Europe also, these practices, these populist um, radical right-wing parties as well, are also being protested and by civil society, by concerned actors. In a case like Hungary, it's quite difficult to resist when it's actually the state propagating these illiberal practices. So their civil society, but also culture workers will have an important role. In other countries where um, it's a more open liberal state and um, there's freedom of speech, obviously both civil society actors and government have a very, very important role in both busting these essentializing myths about migrants and minorities, but at the same time um, promotes education and knowledge about how various people are trying to rebuild their life across various European contexts and in, in cities. And also what's being said today is, well, people want to belong. We can't deconstruct nationalism away, and that's certainly not uh, what, what I uh, would suggest either. Because I think that would be also to underestimate people's need for belonging. And I think working with cultural heritage in particular, it's important to acknowledge people's capacities to hold multiple and sometimes competing narratives within certain boundaries. And also, that was mentioned previously, to focus on a shared humanity as the, the condition for establishing a safe zone for conversation. And another way to also challenge these very exclusionary discourses is also to provide uh, tools for, on, for education, but also to have a more generous and inclusionary definition of nationhood. And I think that work begins obviously through education, but also through the important work you're doing. So thank you very much. I've got a few questions, but, but uh, I want to open up as well. Is, uh, does anyone have a question for Catherine right now? And you can, of course, say it in Swedish, because she understands. Can't see any raised hands for the moment. C can I just yeah. go back yeah. to, the, to the big overheating yeah. project? Because yeah. yeah. um, you've told us now about England and, mm. and uh, Hungary, but... Um, what else places in the world, because I, would, from what I've understood, this, you're in the whole of the, the, the whole world. Yes, we are. Not <laughs> you, but. <laughs> well, we are, we are six researchers working in various parts of the world, from Sierra Leone to Australia to Canada to the Philippines. And we're trying to think comparatively. It's quite ambitious. We're developing a theory of the early 21st century, mm -hmm. or what it means to be human and how humans are affected by the so-called three large crises of globalization. And a key also word for us is scale. So we're looking also at clashes of scale. So one thing is, for instance, in, in, in my study, that I'm looking at how also global capitalism, but also migratory flows affect very local communities, but they are across different landscapes are affected differently. So we're trying to combine the macro picture with the very, very micro picture that uh, traditionally anthropologists have worked with. Because I read somewhere that, that uh, people in different parts of the world react very different to crisis. That's is, true. Is for, that for some people, crisis is a great opportunity. So if, for instance, in Norway, you discover oil, it's a great opportunity. It's funds the nation for a century, you know? But for other people, that kind of the same source of wealth might be the end of their livelihood or they might be, you know, become forced migrants due to the same discovery. So we're looking at, you know, the contradiction that a crisis for, for one nation or one community can be an opportunity for the other. But... Do people in Doncaster, you, you, you said that uh, th they have a big nostalgia for the past. Do they react the same if, uh, if, they, um, uh, um, if they live in South America and they, what say man, Lachtner, big mines there as well? 
do they also yes. go back to the I mean, nostalgia for the past? Yes, what I've seen with my colleagues, particularly one who's worked in, um, in the Philippines, where the US had a great military presence that provided jobs and security, when they left, there was a big Navy nostalgia for the nostalgia towards the American Marines. Mm -hmm. So in general, you know, if there's one big industry that provides jobs, it provides also security, future, identity, meaning, and what we call culture. It becomes a part of culture heritage. And when that is shattered, and when that is, you know, there were quite strong testimonies when I interviewed people. One said, you know, I hope I die before my grandchildren because there's no future. And that goes straight into, you know, the fear of not being able to reproduce yourself. I think that's quite, and I'm not suggesting here, you know, that we can go to, to Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania and say, well, it's all about the white, angry men and losers of globalization. It, that's a part of the analysis, but it's also others who are protesting to the same forces who are, you know, have very much ontological security, much income, and belongs to the middle class and so forth. But I definitely think we can see, um, based on these micro findings in various contexts, that there are some patterns, at least, in, in, in how identity politics and how culture heritage can be politicized to reduce this sense of existential insecurity. But, but how, how, I'm thinking of an ex inclusive view of, of cultural heritage. How can that, can that, uh, is that a, a possibility in, in such a diverse world as we live in? And, and no, this I'm last <laughs> night and uh, everything that's happened. No, I think uh, Adam said it quite uh, eloquently. He said, you know, it's not about deconstructing away the past. It's also being able to believe in that this is a past you can believe in, you can be proud of. And to actually take back nationalism from those who have hijacked it. Because in a, in a way, I think the politician had a point. You know, people want to belong and, and people want to be be proud and it, if anything it's being seen that people identify with closer communities with the region with their family with kinship and even with the nation but for some people washington and brussels might be too far away so this is also what's happening it, it, it's also really it's it's a sign that people want to belong in a in closer on a you know not, not have the distance. Is yeah. it, so is it like uh, the more global we get, the more, lo more local we react? Definitely. I think this uh, obviously are uh, reactions to the sense of alienation, alienation created by processes of uh, globalization and people want to scale down the belonging. But in terms of, you know, what ca can we belong to the nation? Yes, for sure. And, and for sure there can be um, proud belonging to the past, and one does need to con deconstruct the past for that to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any waving hands anywhere? There we go, Kesar. Uh, Kesar. <laughs> Sorry, I just pronounced it in English. <laughs> it's, it's all right. Uh, hey, Kesar Mahmoud, Riksantikvarnbetet. I have a question. Och det, jag tycker det är intressant att du säger att vi inte kan dekonstruera nationella identiteter eller gemenskaper. Men frågan är bara hur kan vi fylla dem med ett nytt innehåll? Mm. För det är som Thomas Hylland Eriksson brukar säga att det sista en fisk blir medveten om är vattnet. Mm. Och hur gör vi folk medvetna att de simmar runt ett vatten och att vi behöver ett nytt vatten? För det kommer in nya fiskar. I think that's a, that's a very good metaphor. Um, but I think to create inclusionary attachment to the past, one can you know, acknowledge that there can be also multiple ways of relating to the past. And I'm not talking against deconstruction. In the case of Hungary, I think it's very much needed to kind of, you know, well, this story is obviously excluding someone. But I think to, you know, how to acknowledge also that we're living in a super diverse world and to create encounter not to create, but to create these rooms for dialogue, safe spaces for airing also disagreements, to, to facilitate the community of disagreement even. And again, as Adam said, in Sweden, I don't know uh, if that's true, but he said there's been a kind of neurotic and nervous, nervous engagement with the past. And it's kind of been so, people haven't been able to touch it almost because they're afraid of, of what that 
airing of disagreement might result in. So there's been a kind of consensus orientation. But I think if one has multiple views and, and being able to acknowledge, yes, we have a shared humanity, but we also have a shared community of disagreements. So how can one create then maybe a, a new, more inclusionary definition of nationhood based on, on those two? Yeah. I don't know if that answers you, yeah. Hej, Elin Sundin, Stockholm Stadshus. Um, jag tänker så här. Nästa plats, kommer det att ligga i USA? Och vilken typ av stad eller kommun kommer det att vara givet nu? Um, vad resultatet uh, sen i den nya presidenten blir vid Trump? Och hur, hur ser du på de frågeställningar som ni i så fall skulle um, ställa där? No, I mean, we're already there in a way. I mean, the states I mentioned, I mean, the, the election today also witnesses the battle over nationhood and national identity in the states between a more exclusionary definition and one that celebrates more diversity and equality. And as we've seen which kind of narrative won. But I think, again, you know, the, the path forwards would obviously be to acknowledge both the, the rage and the despair that brought also Trump to the presidency, but while also acknowledging the despair on the other side. And it's at, at the moment, it's a very polarized you know, nation, and hopefully it's, I know, I have to say, I'm, I'm actually an American citizen, so I voted, so I had some stakes in this election as well. I felt I did, I did my part, but uh, anyway, so... Um, Yeah, what can I say? I think it's, um, there are strong similarities. There are strong similarities. And I think it's, um, only time will show, you know, speaking of generous definitions of nationhood. And, um, no, sorry. Fler frågor? Um, oh yeah, here we go. Here we go. Yes. Someone got a microphone? Two questions. <laughs> Two hands, one question. Och stå gärna upp när du ställer frågan. Tack. Hej, Lina Wennersten, Riksutställningar. Jag tänkte bara på det här kulturhuset du nämnde där det inte fungerade. Ja. Eh, har ni några sådana exempel där det har fungerat? Där man har hittat den här mötesplatsen? So. Uh, in, in Doncaster, the spaces for cultural diversity and inclusion that did work were the more scale, small scale ones, like this publication or cafe culture. And you had lots of local cosmopolitans. And that's why I said that even in these small uh, places, it's, you, you will find a tension. And even that one that voted for Nigel Farage the one minute would be a very cosmopolitan the other. So you do even see this contradiction. And I think that's also a very good starting point. It's not that people are, you know, static, loyal to one, one vision, but actually changing. But, to, the, but the answer would be that it were the small, the small scale initiatives that were working the most. Yeah. Not the huge culture center, unfortunately. So we have more vifta, vifta högt och och stort. Nej, men ni får hojta i så fall också. Um, yeah. I read something that Thomas, Thomas Hilland Eriksson uh, wrote, and that was uh, what I uh, thought was the goal for the whole project. And I'm going to read it here. <laughs> so uh, then you can say if it is the goal yeah. or not. <laughs> um, the project is committed to produce knowledge that can be used locally translocally and indeed globally in the quest for a more equitable, sustainable future on the planet. That's quite big, isn't it? That's quite big, and that's uh, <laughs> speaking of the instrumentalization of research, which we, we tend not to give too much policy advice. But, but yes, I didn't know about this particular goal, mm -hmm. it's new. But, <laughs> but I have to say that we're trying to, based on this local finding, to also not make sweeping generalization, but to identify how the macro interacts with the micro. So, yeah. Will you succeed? 
hopefully, hopefully, we just published this book, uh, Identity Destabilized, which uh, I can recommend you to read then. And I, I, I hope we're having a workshop tomorrow on the concept of flexibility and scale. So I think in theoretical innovation, we are succeeding. And, and now it's also to bring out to policymakers and, and uh, you know, users of our knowledge, which is also important. Yeah. And are you in, in the beginning, in the middle, or are you in, in the end of this project? Uh, we're somewhere closing, we're clo having a closing conference next year. So we have okay. one more year left. Yeah. And, and since uh, part of the planet is, planet is here, um, how can we take part of, of the results? We have an own website, overheating.com, or you can go to the Department of Social Anthropology, University of Oslo. And we also have uh, quite an active um, Facebook uh, page, if you're on Facebook, uh, or I, many of you probably are, yes. Thank you, Thank you, so you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Då tar vi 15 minuters bensträckare 16 och 15 samlas vi här igen.